Hello, and welcome to the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Master Gardener Growing Season webcast series. My name is Susan DeBleek, and I'm the Assistant Coordinator for the Iowa Master Gardener Program. I wanted to give you a quick introduction to our two-hour webcast today. This year's series is focused on a variety of topics to help your garden become the best that it can be. These webcasts are intended for Master Gardener volunteers and also community members to help you bring your garden projects to the next level. This is a three-part series. Today's webcast is the first in the three-part series. The title is Insect Update and Tree Care. You're going to be learning about invasive insects in Iowa and also learn about how to maintain the health of your trees. A couple materials we have for you today. You have a worksheet so you can take notes and also see a list of resources that our presenters have listed. And also we have a link there to the online evaluation form. Please fill it out to give us feedback on this presentation. A reminder to our Master Gardener volunteers to log your continuing education hours. Each year, active Master Gardeners must log 10 continuing education hours online. Please don't forget to go to the Master Gardener Volunteer Reporting System to log your hours today. Our first presenter is Donald Lewis. Hello, my name is Donald Lewis, Professor of Entomology and Extension Entomologist at Iowa State University. And today we're going to talk about a few of Iowa's latest and greatest invasive insects. Of course, that immediately brings up the question, what are invasive insects? And these are pests that have been introduced. They were not here in Iowa. They were not here in the United States originally, but they are adventive in that they have come from somewhere else and they are now arrived and established on this continent. Invasive insects are also likely to spread because they find a favorable habitat without many natural controls, and they are pests. That's one of the requirements here, is that they're likely to cause economic or environmental harm because of their presence here in the United States. If we go to Wikipedia and look up invasive species, we find a list of 86 different insect species that meet that definition of invasive that I just gave you. And that includes things that you've probably heard about, the gypsy moth, of course, our multicolored Asian lady beetle, as well as the Asian tiger mosquito that we're watching because of the potential transmission of Zika virus. There are five species of mites that are listed as invasive, and that includes the varroa mite and the tracheal mite that are so damaging to our honeybee hives. The night crawler is an invasive species in that it was not original to the United States. It was introduced here accidentally with the, col the uh, colonists, and it has invaded almost the entire United States and including some fragile ecosystems where it is now a pest. There are 21 species of mammals, including, they think, cats and dogs. Feral cats, feral dogs would meet the definition. And then, of course, there are lots of plants, our famous multiflora rose, black nightshade, amber honeysuckle, which is overtaking many of our woodlands, is in this list of invasive species. So you can see how this definition fits many things that you're already familiar with. And you're probably familiar with the four invasive insects that I'm going to talk about as being pests in Iowa. We will talk about the emerald ash borer, the brown marmorated stink bug, the spotted wing drosophila, and one of everybody's favorites, the Japanese beetle. Starting with emerald ash borer, which is a small insect, you can see that based on its presence there on Lincoln's head on the penny. It's only about half an inch long, but more importantly, it's only an eighth of an inch wide. It is a very long, slender insect. It is a wood boring beetle, that is, it lives inside trees, and it attacks and kills ash trees. That's all of the trees in the genus Fraxinus. It doesn't matter whether it's a green ash, a white ash, or a black ash. It will eventually attack and kill those trees. The emerald ash borer is a primary invader. It does not wait for the trees to be stressed the way other borers do. This one will attack perfectly healthy trees, though it prefers unhealthy trees. Eventually, it will get to all of them. 
Emerald ash borer was discovered in Detroit back in 2002, although it had been in the country for probably a decade before it was identified and diagnosed. And in the intervening time, it has moved to 32 different states, and it's found now all the way from Boulder, Colorado to New Hampshire, all the way from Minnesota down to Georgia. So in those few years that it has been here, it has moved very well and moved around the country, and in the process, killing large numbers of ash trees. All of the varieties of ash, including the Marshall Seedless, the Patmore, the Autumn Purple, are also susceptible, as well as some of the other species in that Fraxinus genus. Emerald ash borer has a complete life cycle, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And when the adults emerge, they mate, and then the female lays her eggs in little niches in the bark of the ash tree. The eggs hatch into larvae, which live under the bark and do the girdling damage and spend the whole summer inside the tree before uh, wading through the winter as larvae and transforming to the pupal stage and to the adults the following year. For us, emerald ash borer adults are going to be found in June and they're only going to be active for about one month. During that time, she has to eat a little bit of the leaf material to gain some energy. She'll mate with a male, and then the female will begin to lay eggs on the bark of the tree. Eggs hatch in a week or two, and then that tiny first instar larva burrows through the bark and begins to feed in the cambium layer, that thin little growth layer between bark and wood. They will be in there uh, eating, growing, moving along, creating a winding tunnel that will eventually girdle the tree and then spend the winter as a larva before emerging the following year to repeat the cycle. So one generation per year. It is the larvae that cause the damage and as the larva feeds and grows, it chews a tunnel through the cambium layer and on the picture on the left, you see all those crisscrossing tunnels that have completely girdled the tree to the point that water and nutrients are no longer able to move through that tree and that tree is uh, already dead or soon will be because of that. So larvae inside the tree are the damaging stage. The adults are only outside of the tree to mate and reproduce and start the cycle over. In Iowa, the, our first infestation was found up in Alamakee County back in 2010. And since then, we have determined that emerald ash borer is in, is in at least 57 of Iowa's counties. You can see that we found 14 new county records back last year in 2017. And at the time of this recording, which is uh, in May, we have found four emerald ash borer infested counties already this year. Now, just because they have been found in a county doesn't mean the entire county is infested. It means it was found at least one place in that county. So it looks like emerald ash borer must be everywhere, but if you think about it being in one or a few spots in those counties, it really is quite rare still and still very widespread. The Infestations have been confirmed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. That is, members of the Emerald Ash Borer Iowa team located or were alerted to suspect trees. The trees were examined, samples were collected, the samples were sent off to Washington, D.C., where a USDA expert confirmed that it was Emerald Ash Borer. That's how you get your county on a map. Your county is not infested just because your garden center is selling insecticides for the control of emerald ash borer. It's not the neighbor says it's there, therefore we're going to color the map or you should start to worry about it. And fraud has occurred with emerald ash borer. So just because a tree care company is going door to door saying, it's here, it's here, you should treat, doesn't mean it's in your county. Also, people see lots and lots of shiny green insects. And so one of the things the challenges as master gardeners is being able to recognize the emerald ash borer from all the other shiny green insects. So here's your first quiz of this particular webinar. Is this insect pictured here an emerald ash borer? No, it's not. This is the tiger beetle. They are shiny green, but you see those bulging eyes, you see those obvious legs and that 
thorax that is thinner than the rest of the body. These are rapid running predators that we find on the woodland floor. So they're about three quarters of an inch, they're longer than the emerald ash borer, and they certainly don't have that long tapered carrot shape. What about this insect? This insect was sent to Iowa State University by someone who said, I have emerald ash borer, should I treat my ash tree? Is this an emerald ash borer? No, that is a green bottle fly. See, it only has two wings. It's not a beetle at all. But this is what's happened out here with people searching so diligently to find emerald ash borer that they find all of these different shiny green insects. What about this inch and a half long dark green insect? Is this an emerald ash borer? Well, at an inch and a half, no. It's way too big to be an emerald ash borer. It's got the entirely wrong shape. This one is, is one of the ground beetles, and it's one that's called the caterpillar hunter. This is a predator that searches at night, finds caterpillars on the ground, chops them into little pieces, and eats them. One last quiz question. Is either one of these two insects the emerald ash borer? No. The one on the left is a sweat bee one of thousands of sweat bees we have in the United States, but it is shiny green. And so thank you to people who find shiny green insects and send them in. Fortunately, most of what are sent to us are not emerald ash borer. The middle picture is called the dogbane beetle, and it's an insect that feeds on hemp dogbane. It has some iridescence colors to it, and one of those is uh, kind of this metallic green. So lots of ways to not have emerald ash borer, and confirming that you have emerald ash borer is a bit of a problem that requires some careful analysis, and we think rather than rely on finding beetles, you should be watching the condition of your tree. What are you going to do if you have an ash tree and you're worried about emerald ash borer? There are at least three strategies to, con to consider. One is to do nothing. No one can make you cut down your ash tree. No one can make you or force you to treat your ash tree. Whatever you do is up to you, and similarly, paying for it will be up to you. There is no federal or state money to reimburse you for the loss of your ash tree, so you get to decide what you want to do, and one of the things you could do is just wait, see what happens. The uh, emerald ash borer is not everywhere. It may not be in your tree for a long time to come. So waiting is a practical uh, alternative for many of us. You could also decide that now is the time to remove an ash tree that's not doing well, an ash tree that might be in the wrong spot, an ash tree that is failing, and then replace that with another species. Now if you think about long term, sooner or later you're going to replace that ash tree and maybe now is the right time to do that. Your third option is to use preventive insecticide treatments. These are insecticides that go into the tree to kill the borers and protect your tree from that particular damage that we described. The remove and replace strategy is probably easier to think about if you own a lot of ash trees, say a city or a park or a golf course or a university campus. You might say, I've got a lot of ash trees. I could cut down some and diversify now and spread out the cost of removing all those trees. We have found golf courses and some neighborhoods that are 75% ash trees. If they do nothing and have to replace all of those ash trees at once, it will be a huge expense for them. It will be a huge loss. It will be a huge effort to keep up with the dying ash trees if you try to do it all at once. So removing and replacing could be an option, especially if your tree is very old, if it's very weak, if it's in the wrong spot, if it has structural issues, maybe it was struck by lightning. If there's something wrong with it, like it has lost part of its bark, it would be a good tree to remove and replace. An example of this process is what's been done at the Iowa State University campus. Back in 2009, they inventoried the trees on campus and found that of the 6,200 shade trees on campus, 1,200 of them were ash trees, or about 20%. They have taken down approximately 70 ash trees per year, every year, and replaced them with something else. We still have 650 ash trees on campus. 
They are treating some of them that are in highly uh, visible areas. They're treating trees that have a high value to the university landscape. But eventually, we're going to lose some more of those, but it's not as many as if we had waited and had to lose them all at once. So replacement could be the option for you. Insecticides will protect your ash tree. They will also rescue your tree if it already has emerald ash borer. The first step is to make sure you do have an ash tree, and that's not always easy for some people. They call us out to look at their tree, and it turns out to be a maple tree. So tree identification is an important part of this. The tree must be healthy and vigorous for the insecticides to work, and it has to be a valuable tree that would justify the cost because you're going to be treating this tree every year or every other year for the foreseeable future. Maybe not forever, but at least for the foreseeable future, this is going to be a strategy to keep that ash tree alive because it so enhances your landscape and it is so important to you. We treat emerald ash borers when they are for emerald ash borers when the tree is at high risk, which has been defined as a confirmed infestation within 15 miles of your tree. Treatments need to be done in the springtime when the tree is growing. April to mid-May is the ideal time. You can do it yourself if you have a small tree less than 20 inches in diameter, but if it's a large tree, larger than 20 inches in diameter, the do-it-yourself chemicals will not do a good job and you'll need to hire a certified applicator who is likely to charge you about $15 per diameter inch. Now that's not a lot of money. A 30 inch ash tree would cost you $450 to treat this year. And you'll probably have to do it in two more years. So over the long haul that will add up, but each treatment is not prohibitively expensive under most conditions. The insecticides that are used are systemic insecticides. That is, they can be put on the soil or they can be put into the trunk, and then they will move up into the foliage and will kill the adults as they're feeding on the leaves immer immediately after emerging through the bark. The insecticide in the wood of the tree will also kill the larvae as they are feeding just under the bark. Soil moisture, the development of new leaves, ongoing transpiration, are all ways that will improve the movement of the insecticide through the tree. There are insecticides that can be used later in the season, but only if moisture is available. We would not make those treatments during a drought because water will not be moving up the tree as well at that time of year. I want to revisit that definition of a high risk. Your tree is at high risk if emerald ash borer is within 15 miles, and how would you know that? Well, every time we get a new county record, the Iowa Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Agriculture issue this map that shows emerald ash borer detections in Iowa. Again, this map was up to date as of April 13th, 20, uh, 2018, and would be, um, you could find this online by looking for emerald ash borer detections in Iowa. The brown areas, the brown circles on this map are those 15 mile radii around confirmed infestations. So in the southern half of Iowa, pretty much the whole part of the, that part of the state is now in a, an infested area, but the rest of us are maybe between infestations and there's a large part of northern Iowa where we have not yet detected any. So this map helps you decide, is your tree at high risk? If you are within one of the brown circles, then the answer is yes, and it's time to decide what your strategy is going to be. Those homeowner treatments I, I mentioned, under 20 inches in diameter, you can use a, a concentrated insecticide that you dilute with water and drench next to the tree trunk. On even smaller trees, you can use a granular formulation of insecticide that you spread evenly within 18 inches of the trunk and then irrigate to move that granule into the root system so that it goes up through the tree. Those are the do-it-yourself treatments. The, home, the professional treatments done by certified applicators could also be soil drenched with a different formulation and concentration than what's available to you. 
they can do soil injection. That is, they put a concentrated insecticide down into the root zone so it moves up into the tree. But the most popular treatment that we're hearing about around the state is this trunk injection, where tiny holes are drilled into the trunk of the tree, small amounts of the insecticide are injected every few inches around the circumference of the tree, and then the insecticide moves up through the tree from there. Trunk injection is not necessarily better, it is just more popular. All of these treatments work, including the basal trunk spray, where as an insecticide solution is sprayed onto the trunk, and that solution contains a penetrant that allows the insecticide to move through the bark into the vascular system of the tree. So the professionals have uh, options available. If you're going to hire a professional, our, our uh, recommendation is to get at least, least two inspections and estimates. Make sure it's an ash tree. Make sure it's an, a, a target of emerald ash borer. Get very good explanations of what's going to be done, when, by whom, and how. And then compare your estimates and pick the one that sounds best for you. Not every company is going to be your best choice, so it pays to shop around and find the one that um, describes their treatment in a way that satisfies you that they're going to do a good job of protecting your ash tree from the emerald ash borer. So that ends the first of them. Let's take a deep breath and we'll move on to the next one, brown marmorated stink bug. Brown marmorated stink bug is one of many stink bugs that we have in the United States, including many brown stink bugs in Iowa. This one's about the same size as all of our other stink bugs. That 17 millimeters puts it at about half an inch. They have that distinctive shield shape. They're widest at the shoulders and from there it tapers to their tail end. The brown marmorated stink bug is unique in that there are white bands between the segments of the, of the antennae. So you see there where the arrow is pointing, it's po the upper arrow is pointing to a dark zone between two light zones on the antennae. Those bands are what make this stink bug distinctive. The light and dark bands on the, uh, under the ring of the abdomen are not necessarily unique, but they, very are, they are very obvious on the brown marmorated stink bug. Brown marmorated stink bug though, uh, the word marmorated means marbled which also describes that mottled or speckled appearance on the back. Only been in the United States since about 1998, although it was probably here before it was identified. It is a plant feeding stink bug that is an agricultural pest in its native range of China, Japan, and Korea. Again, it was found in Pennsylvania back in 1998. By 2010, it had been reported in 22 different states with some of the eastern states reporting severe crop damage, particular, particularly apples in Maryland were heavily damaged by the brown marmorated stink bug. By 2017, it's now been reported in 44 different states and will probably continue to spread, but it will also continue to increase in the areas where it has been reported. You can see here the map from uh, the national map shows those red states where crop loss has occurred. The brown marmorated stink bug feeds on sap from various crops, and when it does so, it ruins the saleability of those crops, and farmers lose their ability to market apples, tomatoes, sweet corn, and others. The yellow states, including Iowa, are states where it has been found in people's homes. And that's an, an observation or a behavior that I'll talk about here in a little bit. We have found brown marmorated stink bug as a nuisance pest in Iowa. We have not yet found it as a crop pest in Iowa. So another pop quiz. We talked about the brown marmorated stink bug at the, at the beginning of this section. Is this a brown marmorated stink bug or not? No, this one is not. The brown marmorated stink bug is now on the right. The one on the left is the one that we call brown stink bug or one spotted stink bug for a single spot on the underside of the male abdomen. But you can see it has dark colored antennae with no light colored bands. 
and those points on the thor on the uh, front of the thorax are really sticking out there quite sharp on the brown stink bug where they're not so pointed on the brown marmorated stink bug. So give yourself a quiz point question there for saying no to that one. What about this one? Is this the brown marmorated stink bug or not? No, nope, this one is called the spined soldier bug. And it gets the name spine from those shoulders that stick out there quite sharp. You can see it has orange antennae with no white marks in it. And then in the back, at the very tip of the wing, there's a little black stripe in the clear membrane at the very tip of the wing. Spine soldier bug is beneficial. There are plant feeding stink bugs and there are predatory stink bugs. The spine soldier bug is a predator that feeds on other insects. You can buy spine soldier bugs and release them in your garden. They will feed on caterpillars. They will suck dry aphids. They will look for other insects and feed on them. So the spine soldier bug is one you need to recognize because it is beneficial. Finally, this quiz question, is this insect on pumpkins and squash brown marmorated stink bug or not? No, the insect we find on squash and pumpkins is called the squash bug. Now, it does stink, but not all insects that stink are stink bugs. But commonly, Iowans find this inch-long, uh, very elongate insect on their squash and pumpkins, and they call it stink bug, even though it's not. And you can see the shape is all wrong, the antennae are solid dark, and the fact that it's feeding on your pumpkin and squash leaves would be a clue to you that it is the squash bug. Those eggs that she is laying will hatch into little tiny green, then silvery gray nymphs that will feed on sap from the squash or pumpkin leaves, often causing those leaves to wilt, turn black, and die. So squash bug can be a serious pest of pumpkins and squash, but it is not the brown marmorated stink bug that we're looking for. The brown marmorated stink bugs, like a lot of our insects, spend the winter in protected locations, and by May and June, they are out looking to feed on sap from a wide variety of plants. They mate and lay eggs. Nymphs will be feeding on those plants through the early summer, and then will be adults in the uh, fall of the year, ready to go into hibernation and spend the, uh, the winter waiting for spring to return. So it's a familiar life cycle. It's a simple life cycle with only three stages, egg, nymph, and adult. And it's a, a life cycle that you should be feel familiar with from many other insects where we see that, including the squash bug that we just talked about. The brown marmorated stink bug is not a picky eater. It feeds on almost everything, including developing fruits, vegetables, corn and soybeans. It will even feed through the tender bark of trees and shrubs and vines and flowers. Where it feeds on developing fruit, it leaves a small hole or a small speckle, and the apple will stop developing where those punctures took place, and there will be a corky spot underneath the surface of the skin, or the, under the surface of the apple, and those apples then become unsaleable. Tomatoes often stop development, like you see in the top center picture. Green peppers will have these <laughs> discolored spots. And when they feed on corn, they interfere with pollination and kernel set, and you get ears that have very few kernels of corn on them. So this is an equal opportunity offender. It will feed on lots of our crops, should it decide to, here in the Midwest. And then, to make it an even more... Uh, outrageous pest. In the fall of the year, after they have fed on all those plants, they behave like a box elder bug and they move to the side of the house to come indoors. This is what has been reported in Iowa, people finding them either in or on their house. They'll be on the house in late September and October, and then they'll be indoors for the rest of the winter. When they come in, they're large, they're noisy, they buzz around, their flying makes an audible sound, and they do stink. Most people compare it to a smell that's similar to cilantro. So maybe you don't think they stink, but most people do. This type of massive infestation on the side of the house that they have seen in the eastern part of the United States 
has not been reported yet um, out here in the Midwest. It could happen. It just hasn't happened yet since our first stink bugs were found in Iowa back in 2011. Indoors, they do not hurt anything other than just crawl around and drive you nuts. They are extremely annoying, especially if they are present in large numbers. In my house, in three years, I have found six stink bugs. I can still count on my fingers the total number of stink bugs I have found in my house here in Ames. So my populations are very, very low compared to the images that we see from other parts of the country, especially the eastern part of the United States and other parts of the world where this is a household invader in Italy and other places. So as a household invader, Iowans have been reporting this to us since 2011. And we now have um, the brown marmorated stink bug in about 25 different counties. But if it's in Dubuque, Council Bluffs, and Burlington, it's probably in most counties in between, and it just hasn't been reported to us yet. So as you're looking at this map, if you're in a county that has not yet been colored in and given a date, let us know if you find brown marmorated stink bugs on your house this coming fall, and we'll add you to the map. But this map is up to date as of early 2018, our last report that we received was from Wapalo County, and that came in during March of 2018. So they are out there. They are causing a problem as a household invader, and it's one we're watching for, hoping it doesn't get a lot worse, but we are braced for crop damage someday if, it, uh, if it's going to happen. Spotted wing Drosophila is a small fly, a small gnat that looks a lot like the Drosophila or the fruit fly that you see on cracked tomatoes, overripe muskmelon, getting into your wine glass in the, in the fall. It's very similar to that, but it's also called a game changer because of what it is doing to raspberry growers, both gardeners and commercial producers around the United States. Spotted wing Drosophila is, again, is a small fly, and it gets the name because the males have spots in their wings. Again, raspberry is one of its favorite hosts here in Iowa and across the Midwest. Not its only host, but you see on the raspberry how tiny this fly really is. The problem is that this is an invasive insect that was native to Japan, China, and other parts of the, the Far East and was first a pest in the continental United States back in 2008. Now, it had been in Hawaii for many years before that. So it was an invasive insect into uh, the United States a long time ago, but onto the continental United States only just a decade ago. And in that decade, it has now moved across the entire United States. It is a pest of thin-skinned fruit because the female attacks healthy fruit as it's ripening while it is still on the plant. She lays her eggs in the fruit, and then the fruit is ruined for uh, marketability. Normal fruit flies, the, the regular vinegar fly that you find in your house, on your tomatoes and so forth, will only attack fruits that are cracked or rotted or fermenting or already open because of some bruise or some injury. The spotted wing drosophila does not wait for injury to happen. She injures the fruit herself in order to get her legs inside. So there in the top left is the regular fruit fly, Drosophila melangaster, that you may have seen in your house, you may have used in genetics experiments when you were in school. And below it is the male of the spotted wing Drosophila, where you can see the two spots. Again, this is an eighth of an inch long gnat, a very small uh, fruit fly. Both species have bright red eyes when they're alive. Those eyes discolor if, they, if they've been dead. And they have a striped abdomen. And the way we recognize them is by finding the males and finding those spots in the wings. So there's the male wing. There's also some bands on the legs. The female is identified by that ovipositor. Ovipositor is the egg-laying organ on the end of the abdomen of insects. And in the case of the spotted wing Drosophila, the female's ovipositor is a double saw blade. And with that double saw blade, she can slit the skin of fruits so that her eggs go into the juicy interior of the fruit. 
So she's well adapted for perpetuating the species by getting the eggs, getting her offspring into a place where they have the highest likelihood of survival. So spotted wing drosophila uh, has some special mechanisms that allow it to be so damaging to our fruit crops in the fall of the year. Without a doubt, raspberries and blackberries are at the top of the list for damage by spotted wing drosophila because they are ripening at the time of the year when the fruit fly is at its peak. Fruit flies start at very low levels in the springtime. They feed on some wild hosts during the spring, and then their population grows through successive generations, very quick um, generations, and the population is exploding at the same time your raspberries are ripening. They're also a pest in blueberries and aronia. They could be a pest in cherries, peaches, plums, and apples, but either those are ripening earlier in the season when the pi fly population is low, or the skin is thick enough that the fly doesn't try to lay her eggs through it. So without a doubt, raspberries and blackberries are the ones who are taking the brunt of spotted wing drosophila damage in the United, uh, here in Iowa. They will feed on the fruits of lots of different things, and we think maybe mulberry is one of those that keeps them going until we have ripening fruit in the garden. But you can see they're also in a lot of other crops or a lot of other plants that may be around your garden or nearby where they can reproduce. Here's a map that's getting a little old. It was updated in last time in 2013. Again, it was found in California back in 2008, and by seven years later, it had pretty much covered the entire United States. So it has not been shy about moving. It could have been moved in fruit as we pick strawberries and cherries and other fruits in California and ship them to the eastern part of the United States, we could have been moving spotted wing drosophila with the fruit. It's unlikely that the fly flew on its own to get as far as it has, but it covered the United States very, very quickly, and it's now a problem for almost all of us. We have not done a systematic survey of spotted wing drosophila in Iowa. Everywhere we have looked, we have found it. And so the map that shows those scattered locations are just the places that it's been reported to us. We assume it is statewide. We assume every raspberry grower, every gardener with raspberry plants has the potential to, be, uh, to see the spotted wing drosophila, drosophila damaging their crop, but we just haven't confirmed that yet. But our assumption is that the insect is statewide. It's a fly, so it has a complete life cycle, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And so the development is one that you're familiar with because you, you know how maggots develop from flies or from fly eggs. And then they go into a pupa stage where they make the transformation from larva to fly, just like a caterpillar goes into a cocoon to make the transformation from caterpillar to moth. So complete life cycle is what they have. And again, it's that serrated ovipositor that allows the female to lay her eggs into the fruit. The eggs hatch very quickly, probably within hours to within a day, and then you have very tiny larvae in the fruit. The ones in the upper right-hand picture that are large enough to see with the naked eye have probably been there for several days. It only takes a few days for the larvae to grow, but they started out as very tiny first instar larvae, wallowing in the fruit juices, mushing up the grape, uh, mushing up the fruit, causing um, considerable uh, decay and dissolving of the, of the flesh of the fruit. The uh, problem is that the fruit cannot be, will not store. If the larvae are inside the fruit, the fruit just turns to mush. So um, you can't store raspberries for any length of time. And as a commercial grower, you cannot sell contaminated fruit. So if the larvae are in the fruit, you cannot sell the, uh, legally sell the fruit either. The fruit are susceptible from first color, especially as we think about raspberries. Just as they're starting to color up on the, vine, on, the, on the plants, the female will find those ripening fruits and lay her eggs through the skin into the intact fruit. The egg-laying scar will be enough to cause a dimple on the fruit, 
but then the larvae inside become a contamination as they feed and develop. Eventually, the fruit wrinkles, softens, turns juicy. Eventually, it will collapse, deteriorate, and mold if nothing is done. So uh, the damage is quite complete. There's no doubt that when, when the damage is finished, you have lost those berries, you have lost that crop. A generation can happen in as few as nine or 10 days. That means we can have five to 10 generations per summer. So if we don't have a lot of them in early spring, by fall, we can have a population explosion because they've been able to multiply with each generation. Each female can lay hundreds of eggs. The average number of eggs per female is 380, and she will lay one to three eggs each time she slices open the fruit. So at the minimum, your raspberry has one larva inside. It may have three, it may have a dozen. She may continue to lay eggs in the same fruit, or she may move on and spread her eggs around to the others. So the fruit damage is, the, is caused by the larvae that are inside, which is difficult to see at first, which is one advantage for home gardeners. This is not a popular advantage. This is not necessarily a good advantage to think about. But when we talk to home gardeners about what to do with spotted winged drosophila and raspberries in their patch, we tell them pick frequently, pick cleanly, and eat quickly, okay? If you ate fresh fruit immediately, you wouldn't know if there was a larva in there or not. If you let the, the fruit set as those larvae grow, the damage becomes more and more obvious. And here's a picture from the uh, University of Maine that shows what's happened to a box of raspberries left out in the sunshine for only 48 hours. They went from whole fruit to mush to almost nothing but a pile of maggots in two days time. So this is one that will not um, be pleasant news for most growers. And in fact, many growers are giving up rather than try to fight this because it's not an easy one to, to control either. There are no easy answers. We, have, we are used to raising raspberries without the benefit of insecticide. And now we're in a place where if you're going to raise raspberries and not have larvae inside, you're probably going to have to spray. You can practice sanitation. You could use very fine netting, but the netting is going to have to be finer than window screening to keep out those small fruit flies. We monitor for the presence of fruit flies in the raspberry patch and then get ready to use insecticides if they're found, if that's what you want to do to keep the fruit uh, free. Sanitation is easier said than done. We would like to remove the wild host nearby, but again, that frequent clean picking and removing all overripe damaged fruit from the field or from the raspberry patch will help. It will not solve the whole problem, but leaving rotten fruit in the raspberry patch is an invitation for more fruit flies. What do you just do with the uh, old fruit? You can solarize it, that is put it in a black plastic bag and set it in the sunshine. You can bury it, you could freeze it, but you're going to have to freeze it for a long period of time to make sure all the, the larvae are dead. The trapping program is to monitor for the adults. And you put traps in your raspberry patch, and when you find a spotted winged drosophila in your trap and the raspberry, uh, raspberries have started to color, it's time to apply your first spray. So you pick everything you can, everything that's almost ripe, you spray the insecticide, and you wait the pre-harvest interval that will tell you how long you have to wait before you can harvest again. So you pick, you spray, you wait, and then you repeat. You pick, you spray, and you wait. If you wanna know if your spray is working, there are ways to test the fruit for larvae but you could test for larvae just by leaving a fruit, few fruit out in the sunshine to see what happens to them. The maggots will become obvious if they are in there. Traps can be purchased at the store or at, at, on, from chemical companies. You can make them with a plastic cup from the convenience store. You drill some holes in the cup, then you put in either apple cider vinegar or a yeast sugar mixture. You hang a sticky card in that trap. You come back daily to look at the trap 
And if you see spotted ring Drosophila, especially that spotted male in the top center picture, then it's time to begin the insecticide treatment. Not every insecticide is a good choice. As you're looking at the PHI, the pre-harvest interval for raspberries, you see our insecticide bifenthrin requires you to wait three days before you pick again after treatment. Bifenthrin is sold under the trade name 8. You go down the list, you see some others. Esfenvalorate has a 21-day waiting interval. Totally unacceptable during harvest time, during raspberry production season. Malathion turns out to be a good choice. Malathion was an insecticide that was available when I was a kid 60 years ago, and it is still available, it still works, and it has a one-day pre-harvest interval for raspberries and blueberries. So it's one that you could pick, spray, wait only one day, and pick again. Carbaryl, under the trade name 7 that we've used for so many pests, has a seven-day waiting interval. That's really not a good choice uh, for us. Under organic treatments, pyrethrin will kill the flies for only a day or two, but it has a zero-day pre-harvest interval. Pyrethrin is the uh, uh, organic insecticide that could be used if you want if you're in that system, but you're likely to have to spray almost every day. The sprays we're applying are for, for control of the adult flies before they lay their eggs. So that's why we do the trapping to find the flies. When we find the flies, if we continue to find the flies, we continue to spray on the interval we've just talked about. That's it for spotted wing Drosophila. Moving on, one more pest that'll take the rest of our time, and it's a common pest that a lot of people have experience with, so we'll kind of rush to the end of what to do with it. Japanese beetle. As we begin to think about Japanese beetle, your quiz question of the moment is, which one of these two insects pictured here is the Japanese beetle? It's the one on the right. The one on the left is called the multicolored Asian lady beetle. And there are people who don't hear the difference between Asian and Japanese. The multicolored Asian lady beetle is the one that comes to the side of your house in the fall of the year after feeding on aphids in your garden and in the trees and in the fields. And there are people who will call and say, what do I do about the Japanese beetles on the side of my house? And I say to them, oh, you mean the multicolored Asian lady beetle? And they respond, yes, that's what I said, the Japanese beetle. So there's been this confusion with the names, but it's not as confusing as it used to be because more and more people are familiar with the half-inch long Japanese beetle that feeds on the foliage, flowers, and fruits of your garden plants and in your landscape. They have that shiny green metallic head and thorax. The wing covers are kind of a coppery bronze color. And then there are five tufts of hair coming off the sides of the abdomen out from under the wing covers. So identification is pretty easy to do once you know what to look for, the coloration and the tufts of hair. The adults feed on the foliage, flowers, and fruits of over 350 different kinds of plants. At the top of the list, grapes, linden trees, raspberries, roses. That's four down, 346 to go. So it'll feed on almost, every, on almost anything, but it does have its favorites. Then in the late summer, the Japanese beetle is a grub in the grass, and it feeds on the grass roots and can kill your lawn uh, and during that stage. When people have a tree that is defoliated by Japanese beetle, they tend to act like the sky is falling. The thing to remember is defoliated deciduous trees are not dead. This linden tree in the upper right hand corner is on a golf course where I walk my dog. It looked like that every summer from about 2006 to about 2011. That tree is still there, it's still fine, it's still growing. So just because your tree is defoliated doesn't mean it's dead. Now it's not good, but it's not dead. And one of the things we tell people who are in panic mode over their defoliated tree or their defoliated shrubs or roses is that the Japanese beetle has been in the United States for over a hundred years and the eastern United States is still there. 
New Jersey has had Japanese beetles since 1916, and they still have linden trees, they still have roses, they still have grapevines. But the Japanese beetle has moved across the, the United States very slowly, not arriving in Iowa until 1994. It was found in Scott County in 1994. We now have it in about 69 different counties, the ones that are marked here. So if your county is not colored in and you find Japanese beetles this summer, send me a picture and we'll add your county to this map. Now, just like with Emerald Ash Borer, not everybody in an infested county has the same problem. But sooner or later, we all go through the typical invasion curve. That is, we have no Japanese beetles for a long, long number of, number of years. Then they arrive and we find a few. The next year we find a few more. The next year we find a few thousand. The next year we find a few tens of thousands. The population explodes during that exponential growth period of about three to six years. And at that, at that point, the population will begin to moderate. The population will begin to go up and down. So when people are in panic mode looking at their defoliated grapes, we remind them it will not always be this bad. And we have seen ups and downs even through the years. Back there through the late, uh, through 2007, 8, and 9, the populations were really high. And then they disappeared in the 2014 and 15, but they reappeared in 16, and then they were bad in 2017. So years vary, locations vary. It's not always going to be the same for everybody. Japanese beetle has four life stages, life stages egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And it's the adults that we're worried about feeding on our roses and grapes, and they are present from June to early August. Your choices for control are to tolerate the damage. Again, that defoliated linden tree is still alive. It did not die from Japanese beetle defoliation. On small plants, you could screen or hand pick Japanese beetles. If you're in that exponential growth curve phase, picking Japanese beetles by hand will be your full-time hobby. That's all you'll get done. If you must have green leaves on your plants, if you're a, a grape grower that's selling grapes or making wine, you need to protect your, your vines. And we do that by spraying at the beginning of the Japanese beetle season and probably spraying often. They first appear in late June and they will be there until August. And because they are here over an extended period of time, repeated applications of sprays will be, re re be required. We have both contact and systemic insecticides, and we do have some biocontrols to talk about. The systemic insecticides are not used on food crops, and they are not used on linden trees. And linden trees is one of their favorite hosts. But notice that the label for the Bayer Advanced Tree and Shrub Insect Control says, do not apply this product to linden, basswood, or other telia species. That is to protect the pollinators that feed on the nectar and pollen of that tree shortly before the Japanese beetles begin to defoliate the leaves. The insecticides that are available to control Japanese beetles, uh, it's a long list. Almost all of our home garden insecticides will work. Some of them will work longer, some of them will work better, but whatever you all have on hand is probably what you should try first. The, we have a couple of antifeedants, which are repellent insecticides. One of those is called azadiractin. That is called neem, the trade name neem, N-E-E-M. And we also have a kale and clay product sold under the trade name Surround. Neither of these products kill Japanese beetles. They just discourage them from feeding. So neem and Surround might be acceptable choices to you. We also have a new insecticide called Beetle Gone which is a, a strain of Bacillus thuringiensis. It's called BTG, Bacillus thuringiensis gallaria. And it is a, 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 constant, a, a powder that you mix with water and spray over the plants, and it will kill beetles after they eat it. Now, it's a fairly expensive um, product. It costs $150 to make 100 gallons of spray. So that's, uh, that's a lot of money for if I have to spray the tree very many times. Gardens Alive sells it under the trade name Beetlejuice. And 4 to 12 ounces of the product in a gallon of water sells for $25.
$25 to make one gallon of spray to protect your plants from Japanese beetle feeding. University of Maryland tested this product, said it did work until it rained, and then you have to reapply it. So if you're spraying a tree of any size at a price of $25 per gallon and you have to reapply after every rainstorm, it's going to be a lot of money to kill beetles on that tree. What about trapping? You can catch lots of Japanese beetles in one of the traps that are available. It'll be emotionally satisfying. It will not make a difference to your trees. It will not make a difference to your turf grass. It will only make you feel good to see buckets full of dead, smelly Japanese beetles. Trapping beetles is popular, but it has very little benefit. For one thing, Japanese beetles will attract more than the, the traps will attract more Japanese beetles than they catch. The other thing is, unless you have a very few Japanese beetles that you can lure to the other side of the property, it will not protect your ornamentals. People love the satisfaction of finding a lot of dead beetles. Some people claim that it protected their tree. We can't find any research to document that particular um, claim. The white grubs eat the roots in the, well, in the turf grass, causing the grass to wilt and tan and turn tan and then die. When you roll back the sod, you'll see the Japanese beetle white grubs on the soil surface. If that is your uh, problem, you may have discovered it because the skunks and the raccoons came out at night and tilled up the grass to eat the Japanese beetle grubs. But the larvae are present in August, September, and October. And if we're going to treat for Japanese beetles, if we're going to treat for the grubs, we can do so between May, June, July, and early August with a preventive insecticide, or we can use a different insecticide in August and September. If it comes to October and you still have Japanese beetle grubs, it's too late for insecticides to work. Commercial applicators have a long list of insecticides they can use. Grub X and Merit are available to homeowners, as is Grub Gone. Grub Gone is another formulation of the insecticide we just talked about. The rescue treatments, if you're into September trying to treat grubs, you would use, again, either Grub X or Dilox insecticide and water it in according to label directions. Grub Gone is, a, is again, that Bacillus thuringiensis gallaria formulation that does reduce Japanese beetle grubs in the ground if you apply it before egg hatch, that is, if you apply it before the middle of July, and you irrigate it in. I calculated the cost of grub gone granular insecticide. It would cost me twice as much to treat my lawn with grub gone as it would be to buy Scott's Grub X at the local garden center. So it is an expensive option, but it is an organic option for people who might want to use it. One mention about milky spore disease. There's a lot of testimonials on the internet that says, I haven't had grubs since I put down milky spore disease, the bacteria called Pina bacillus papillii. Tree, uh, tests going back into the 1940s found that it usually did not work. And it especially does not work in the upper Midwest. So we do not recommend milky spore. If you want to do it, do an experiment with it to see if it makes a difference. We can't find any justification to use that particular organic treatment for grub control where we are. Finally, when we talk about Japanese beetle, controlling grubs in the soil will not prevent damage to your ornamentals the following year because the beetles are highly mobile and by some estimates may end up 15 miles from where they started. Vice versa, controlling beetles on your ornamentals will not protect your turf grass. So you need site-specific control. If you're going to control Japanese beetles on the trees, you spray the trees. If you're going to tr treat Japanese beetles in the turf, you spray your lawn. Treating one will not protect the other, which is sort of discouraging news in a way. We did it. We made it through all four invasive species. I'll put up my name and address and phone number in case you want to get in touch with me to ever ask any questions. We're always happy to visit with you to answer whatever questions you have. The easiest way to get through to us now is actually by email. So 
feel free to jot down that email address, drlewis at iastate.edu. And anytime I can answer insect questions for you, please feel free to give me a, a holler or, in this case, send me an email. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Good luck this summer. Thank you, Donald. Now we'll be hearing from our second presenter, Jesse Randall. Hi there. My name's Jesse Randall. I'm the ISU Extension Forester. Today we're, we're going to talk a lot about um, what I look for when I go to buy trees. Um, the good, the bad, the ugly. And a lot of times, trust your first impression when you walk up to a tree. And we're going to talk about the different types of, of uh, trees that you can actually plant. And, and just know that there's a lot of resources out there, and I will try to reference other resources as we go through the talk. Um, the, the best thing you can always do is ask a lot of questions. Go to multiple nurseries and, and see the different trees and, and really get a good feel for what is out there. But even before you go to the nursery, you need to understand, and it's critical to really have a good idea of what your soils are like and, and what the drainage is like around where your trees are going to be. Uh, most of our trees do not like wet feet. They don't like heavy, wet gumbo soils. Uh, you need to understand the available space. So trees get big, and if you select the wrong one, uh, it's it's quickly going to have problems because it runs out of space. You also, so, so invariably, you need to know um, a lot of different things about the tree, and that's why we make multiple trips to the nursery. You get an idea of what you like to see, and then you go back and do a little homework about how big that tree is going to be, what it likes, does it match the soils. And then you have to understand, and, and today we're going to go through a lot about what makes good planting stock, and, and what makes poor planting stock. And again, it all factors into how sensitive a site you are, uh, that you have, and, and each of the selections we make in terms of how we plant the tree, what type of tree pot or bare root or bald and burlap we bring home, really depends on all of those other factors. And so that's really the first step. And Gabby did a great uh, talk, and, and you can find that here at... at um, that quick link uh, to her entire talk on how to select the trees based on all of these different um, understandings that we have to have. But real quickly, when we talk about what is sensitive, you know, your oaks, your hickories, your honey locusts, those are all fairly sensitive. They, they have to be planted on the absolute right site or they're going to have long-term problems no matter what style of pot or what style uh, of bare root you get, they're going to have problems if it's a sensitive site and you beat them up. Also, uh, the ones that are fairly tolerant, your silver maples, your basswoods, all of those that are kind of flood-prone trees, they can have more initial problems, let's say, um, either as a young seedling that's bare root or a potted tree, and they can overcome those. So you just have to remember, the more the, the, the tree that falls into the very sensitive category, when you go, you have to have a mental checklist of all of the different problems you see with that tree. And if it is an oak or a hickory or a hunter locust, anything in that left-hand column, you're going to have to have a lower threshold for problems. And, and if you reach, uh, you know, root problems, pruning problems, I would not be buying that tree. So, again, there's a gradient in terms of how that tree can tolerate the sensitivities. But, and Gabby goes over those in, in pretty good detail. But today, you know, my main focus is to work myself out of a job. And it is to talk about the different planting stocks we have and the good and the bad that come along with all of those. And there's trade-offs that we just have to accept. So in the top left corner, you, you have those bare root planting stocks. This is more for the conservation planting, the windbreak plantings, where you're going to be planting hundreds, if not thousands, of trees. They're cheap. They're, they're, so they're, they're inexpensive to plant, but they also have higher mortality. And so when you're buying these in lots of 100, you plant extra knowing you're going to lose some. But even within the bare root planting stock community, 
there are differences in quality. So the seedling in the top left corner, ha they have a lot of lateral roots. And, and when we talk about planting or selecting a tree, it's always about the root system. You buy the biggest, healthiest root system that you can afford, and that tree is going to do much better than saving a few pennies and buying that upper right-hand side, all right? And what I'm doing on the bare root stock is I'm looking for the most amount of lateral roots that come off of that. And preferably, we'd be 5 to 10 lateral roots per system. Even higher uh, is better. So, so more is better when it comes to bare root planting, all right? They're more sensitive. You have to handle them a little differently. You have to get them in earlier in the planting season. And so as the ground thaws uh, and, and before it reaches 50, those trees need to be in early. You know, you're going to be muddy planting those type of trees. But then we have on the bottom left the container grown versus containerized. And, and uh, a lot of this is, is written on the labels, so become uh, familiar and, and just make it a habit to read the labels. And what I see is the big difference. Container grown means that seedling was planted in that container. It has developed at least one year in that container. And normally you can tell this when you pull out a container grown seedling, those roots have begun to form to the shape of the pot, all right? And so you can pull it and the soil out. Containerized can mean a few different things. It can be that they dug up a seedling in uh, out in a nursery bed and just potted that up. And so it hasn't developed uh, a root system in that pot. It could be that they took a bare root seedling, put potting soil in it, and, and potted that up. And, it, and again, you're basically buying a 90-cent bare root seedling for $20, $25, $30. It, it buys you nothing. So be very careful when you read on the label that it's containerized. And then on the right picture, the right-hand side, that's the instant tree. That's the bald and burlap tree. And, and we're going to focus quite a bit on the container grown, and we're going to focus on the bald and burlap today. These trees are big. Uh, they undergo transplant shock in almost every case. And you have to realize every seedling, uh, every tree that you plant is going to have a varying degree of transplant shock. That's just inherent in planting trees. Uh, you're, you're disrupting their root system. You're moving them from one soil to another. And so our rule that we follow uh, is pretty much you will have transplant shock of about one year per inch of caliper, meaning on a two or three inch caliper tree, that tree could just up and die from shock from, from the act of moving that tree and reducing its root systems up to two or three years later. And so what I tell folks is you buy the biggest root system and the smallest caliper you can find. Um, and, and by disproportionately um, shying on the side of a larger root system, you will bounce back from that transplant shock. And the faster we come back from transplant shock, it reduces the chances that the tree will be under stress and be more attractive to insects and disease. And so we want to keep that period of shock as small as possible. So what happens below ground when we decide, well, we want these big trees? This image is, is a tree that was spaded. It, it had the appropriate sized spade uh, for the caliper, and we washed all the roots off of it, all right? You're looking at a root system that remains about 5 to 10% of the roots, and, and you can see on that image that those roots are not the fine feeder roots, and so this tree is going to undergo a tremendous amount of stress for the first few years. It's going to reduce its top growth because the top grows uh, in relation to what happens to the root system. And we've just severed about 90% of the roots. And so that tree will have to scavenge from those larger roots and from stem growth and, and put out new fine feeder roots. So this really shocks that tree. So yes, you're getting a bigger tree, but you're buying a, a fair amount of risk when you have that because of the loss of the fine roots. Compare that to a container grown, and, and here's a seedling that's, it actually was cut off and is, is now facing you. 
This is probably the biggest issue we have with container-grown seedlings out there in the industry. And, and what you're seeing are the girdling roots. And, and you're seeing these roots wrap around and around and around. And, and what happens in a non-perforated solid black plastic pot is the roots hit the edge and turn right or left and then they spin around and around. And as that tree gets larger and larger, those roots get larger and larger. And what eventually will happen is it will become a living noose and it girdles the tree. And I'm gonna show you some examples of those uh, in, in uh, a few slides. So what we can fix these, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but this is the most common thing you're gonna run into with uh, container grown trees. You're also going to run into trees that are way too deep in the pot, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The last that we show are bag-grown trees, and, and uh, I really like those. The bag-grown trees, uh, they're in perforated bags planted in the ground, and, and the roots, they don't hit a hard surface, and they continue to grow out through the bag, and then they can only expand so far until they begin to get the signal that the root uh, has reached the full size of what that bag will allow or bag expand to. And then what happens is it kind of cauterizes that wound. The tree gets the signal to grow fine roots inside of the bag. And so uh, compared to the tree spade, which has maybe 10% of the root system left, and the container grown seedling has all the roots there, but you're going to have to fix it and drop it maybe to 50 to 80% of the roots remaining. The bag grown seedling has probably on the order of 80 to 85 percent of the roots and they're the fine feeder roots. Uh, it greatly reduces the transplant shock and it greatly reduces uh, the maintenance in the first few years after planting. And so yes, you'll pay a little bit more. Yes, you might have to special order them from growers a year or two out. But on the back end, your, your maintenance costs will be much lower. So what happens? Either improper planting or uh, being, being raised in a pot um, is going to cause this problem. All right, This tree was planted too deep. It had a girdling root. And you begin after 20 or 30 years to, be, uh, to see dieback. And it really depends on the sensitivity of the tree. Some trees show it sooner than others. And what we commonly refer to is, you know, the top will begin to die back. Uh, the tree just looks unhealthy. Insects have moved in. And we normally get pictures like this sent to us saying, what's wrong with my trees? Um, well, the first thing, you should not have roots growing around uh, the base of the tree in a circular manner. If you do, you have a girdling root situation. Mushrooms are also a great indication of decay. Um, and and uh, long-term issues. So here we have those tree roots that have been scalped, and you can see right at the base of that tree, right in here, you can begin to see that girdling root, and it's right in along this base. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to go home and walk around your community and look at the trees in the right-of-way, look at the trees just into the neighbor's yards, you'll begin to see these issues. You'll begin to see girdling roots. And one of the best ways while you're out walking around is to look at a tree and envision what that tree would look like if you cut that tree down and were looking like a bird's eye view straight down on the stump. Trees that have girdling roots are going to normally have one flat side on them. And that's the side that's been restricted by its own root system. And so envision a capital D with a straight side and then an arc, all right? Trees that have girdling roots, if you were to cut them down and look at that uh, stump, will have a flat side and then an arc onto it. And so uh, I want you to go home. I want you to walk around town and see just how many of these trees have existing problems that probably started the day it was pulled out of the pot and put in the ground to be planted. So this, this problem can happen from, from being planted too deep, but it can also happen uh, from just being pulled out of the pot without the roots being fixed, without the depth being adjusted, and being put in the hole. And this is probably the most common issue we see with trees uh, today when we have problems. And normally what will happen is this is what we'll, we'll see when we're faced with a tree dying back from the top. And remember, what happens 
above ground is a direct reflection of what's going on below ground in that root system. And on a family vacation up in, in Minnesota, there was a, a, a community that had a new street put in, and they planted all of these trees. And they had a contractor come in. They planted these trees. Every one of them was left in the pot. You have to remove the pot uh, or you're going to have long-term issues uh, with these trees. And this was an entire street lined with probably two to $300 per tree trees, uh, and they were all eventually going to die in 20 to 30 years. And that, that's quite a shame. That was not a staged photo. Um, it, was, it was really quite sad to see. So why do we make so much about um, you know, proper planting depth and, and selecting trees? Really, trees go through two periods of luxury root growth. Again, everybody wants their trees to grow just as fast as possible, get as much caliper growth as possible, be as tall as possible, as fast as possible. And to do that, you need to capture when you're planting trees the spring root growth period and the fall root growth period. And so for me, I only like to plant my trees in the spring and right as the ground thaws, but before the farmers are in the field planting corn is the first period where you get this luxury root growth. All right, there's the, the red line here is root growth. The green line is leaf and stem growth. Okay, and so there's a transition that happens around 50 degrees or when the, the, the farmers are in the field planting corn. What happens is that tree uh, switches over and it begins to grow leaves and stems. And, and so again, everything in life is a trade-off. You go to maintenance growth of roots, all right? And so I try to capture the first grow out in the spring. I go through the summer. Now, early fall, as it begins to cool down and the leaves are, are starting to senesce and transition into the fall period, you begin to have more luxury root growth back here on the back end until the ground starts to freeze, all right? To get a tree through the stress of transplanting shock, you want those trees to grow as many new roots and put out anchors and to find mineral nutrients, to find water, and, and you do that by capitalizing on the tree's physiology and the, and the tree's growth habit. And so you really want to aim for early spring when you plant those trees. By the time those trees grow, they go on sale at the box stores, um, normally it's well into the leaf uh, period and, and those trees are going to struggle. Um, do I still buy them? Yes, they're a discount. But we know now that we have to baby those those trees that are that are discounted for sale. Um, it can be done, but there's more maintenance involved. If you're the type of person that's willing to take that risk and to take on that work, they're a great way to get uh, some nice trees. If you're the type that doesn't have the time to water and to mulch um, religiously, you want to plant one or two strategic trees early on in the spring. So what do we look for in bigger planting stock? Remember, I, I started off by saying your gut is almost always right. Um, and, and you don't need to call me just for verification. Um, you're welcome to if, if that makes you feel better. But when you walk up to trees and you begin to see trees that have damage on them, um, either in the shipping or in the production stage, if you begin to see trees that have stubs uh, from a pruning cut or a poorly um, you know, placed pruning cut, if you begin to see trees that are are not really well maintained, that are that are out in the sun, that are not being mulched in, that have obvious signs of rub damage uh, or transport damage, that's an indication that perhaps you don't want to spend your money on that tree. Now, a lot of times in 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 transportation of trees, you will often see that that on the tag that said you know it's been pruned. Uh, for you well in advance, what they've done is they've just normally uh, cut off the leader to make it easier to ship. And what I'm talking about is right up here at the very top, they've headed this tree off. Now, by heading that tree off, what they're doing is is they're taking the the um, apical dominance and, and what they're doing is they're turning that um, leader uh, and, and by taking it off, they're readjusting the hormone levels, and they're forcing side branches to grow. But then you have to have um, new growth off the top, and, and sometimes that's not always the best, all right? And and you can tell how these trees have been handled, and if, if they are pruned up and they are made to look like a poodle's tail, um, that's an issue. Again, you're trying to keep about 
two-thirds to three-quarters of that tree in live crown. And, and if they've pruned all the branches up uh, to where you don't have about three-quarters of the overall height in live uh, branches with live leaves, you've got an issue, a longer-term issue. That tree's going to grow slower um, and, and lead to longer-term stress on that tree. So let's make sure they're not hiding something. You know, it's an obvious sign when they try to give you something like, uh, they'll call it a rabbit guard or a deer protector. Always lift those guards up to see what's underneath. Uh, a lot of times you'll see some damage. Now that could be a graft union. Don't, don't mistake a graft union for damage. But when it's up off the ground several feet, that's obvious graft damage, all right? Um, and and why did this leader die and get replaced? So that's the first thing. Make sure they're not hiding anything. And I can tell you that a lot of these photos from here on through the end uh, were taken on ISU's campus as shipments of trees come in uh, to be planted on campus. And these are things that we've either accepted or we missed while we were evaluating the, the semi-load. So make sure um, you're, you're, uh, you lift those shelters up and make sure you don't have any visible uh, damage. And because during the lifting process, during the, the, the transport process, things can get damaged. It's okay to refuse a tree that has been damaged uh, in transport. Um, if, if you're having this tree planted in uh, to your landscape, if you've bought a several hundred dollar tree and you're having somebody plant it, Make sure you're there the day they plant it. Make sure you look over that tree as it comes off the truck. And if you see damage, you can send it back. You're, you're buying quality at that point. That's the time to send it back. Don't wait uh, for the tree to be planted and in the hole because then they'll be less likely um, to, to honor that and get it out of there and replace it. So just make sure you're there. Even if you're not the one planting it, make sure you're looking over every aspect. And watch how they handle their trees. You, you can tell if, if the person cares about that tree um, in the way that they handle it. Don't let them drop it. Um, don't let them, you know, drag it on the ground. Make sure that they're handling that because it is a living, living organism. Make sure you check the base of the tree, and this is where the, the pot level of soil meets the tree. You don't want to have open wounds on the base of that tree. And so if we see in this bottom right-hand picture, uh, that could be weed whacker damage. It could be lawnmower damage. Uh, it could be in any of number. It could be a vole or a mole or a mouse damage. Uh, it could be a, any a number of things. That is not something you want. Normally, my threshold for damage on a stem is about 25 percent anything more than 25 percent it becomes a guessing game if that tree is going to be able to seal itself over in time that decay won't start the damage on that bottom right hand picture is more than 25 percent it's approaching about 50 percent there's no way that this tree given that it's in a pot given that it's going to go undergo stress during transplanting is going to be able to seal over that wound. And, and you have to remember, when we wound a tree, it doesn't ever heal. It seals over. That wound will forever be in there. And, and the name of the game when you're either pruning or you've had a wound is getting that to seal over uh, in as short amount of time as possible so that the damage doesn't begin to decay. All right? And so this is another one of those things that we look for. You, you pick up the guard and you look right at the base of that tree. Ba twines or, or binding damage. We're seeing more and more nurseries hold over plants that they don't get sold from one year to the next. All right, they're getting very good at mulching them in, keeping them well watered. The problem is those, those uh, trees in the bald and burlap are being... Uh, tied up and bound with cord, and, and they've made that cord uh, somewhat rot-resistant because they need to hold them for a growing season sometimes, too. What happens is that doesn't stop the tree from growing, and, and if anybody has ever seen it, um, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, and I'm looking right in here. That tree has physically been restricted by the cord. Uh, the tree has expanded, and the cord could only get or allow it to expand so much. And so you've really disrupted the vascular structure there. And that's going to be a weak point um, 
on that tree. And sometimes the tree will just grow straight out and over the cord or the wire. Uh, and that's a real problem that I have. Uh, that tree is not starting off healthy. This is a tree that, that should have been rejected um, because of the, the disruption in the vascular structure. So uh, anytime you're, you're going that route, make sure you check. You can tell when you're at the nursery um, uh, the level of maintenance and care that they have. And, and a lot of times what I'm looking for, how are their tags? And on this, on this left-hand picture, it is pretty evident that this tag and this tree, um, it grew into the tree. It's now included into that branch um, union. I don't like to see that. Um, I, I begin to question now. Um, what other issues am I going to see with that tree if if uh, the tags grew into it, if they didn't have the personnel to go out and change those tags around so they don't grow into it? This, to me, is just an easy red flag to, to pick on uh, and, and to look at. That's that's going to be a problem in, in later later life. How do they handle the trees, all right? When you're at the nursery, it's okay to go at different times of the day. It's okay to watch and see how they handle uh, someone else's trees because if they're handling somebody else's trees in a rough manner when that person isn't there, they probably are going to do the exact same thing for you. And so, you know, you can quickly tell who's operated the, the forklift before, who's strapped trees down before. Um, you know, they should always run those trees um, into or against the wind or, or, or with the wind so the, the, the branches don't break back in the wind if they're moving it when there's leaf-on conditions. They should have buffers. And what I'm looking at is when they, when they tie this tree down, they've wrapped it with burlap. They've got kind of a, a buffer between the ratchet strap and the tree. Um, you, you have to secure your load um, on, that, on that trailer, but you don't want to cause any physical harm or rubbing um, on the stem of that tree. So just know and, and watch how they treat someone else's trees. So you have to you have to watch for damage during shipping. And, and it occurs. It, it, a lot of our trees come in from wholesalers uh, from around the country. And, and you can tell the trees there that were at the bottom of the pile that bounced all the way here from Oregon or Washington. Um, their branches, uh, they can be broken. Um, they can be bound. They can have um, the bindings can, can sometimes rub along the stem and cause injury. If you look at that middle picture, uh, they had a tarp on it. Most likely it was a dark top, uh, and, and, and during, during transport it heated up a little bit and kind of twisted those, those uh, plants around. Will they grow out of it? Probably. Um, but what won't grow out on that right-hand picture are broken tops. Again, you're buying a tree and you want it to have the form that it, it that Mother Nature designed for this plant. And when you break the tops out, it forces those plants uh, into into epicormic sprouts and into forming a new leader. That means there's more work for you when there's broken out tops, and and that's just something to to be aware of when you're buying these these trees. So pots, we we picked a lot on on bald and burlap, but pots have have issues and. And the vast majority of us, this is what we're going to, to face every day, uh, are, are these very issues. And again, along with the same stem issues, most of the problems we see with pots are based on the, the, uh, the root structure and the depth of, of planting because, because a seedling isn't always planted in the, the biggest pot that you're going to buy it in, all right? It's stepped up through various size pots. And, and what they do a lot of times is they'll, they'll take a seedling, a liner, a whip, and, and they'll put it into a small pot, grow it for a year, transplant it into a bigger pot. And, and the, the people that will transplant those, they just take the little pot, potted tree, put it into a bigger pot, add more soil. Well, every time you do that through successive transplantings, you're burying that seedling beyond the root collar, and the root collar is very important. What that leads to is a, a, a tree that has developed in, in pots, and, and the right-hand picture really shows it well. Uh, this tree has lots of girdling roots. Uh, this main root coming right down through kind of the center of that, that picture then turns at a hard 90 and comes straight back uh, up and around, all right? 
We've also done quite a bit of work where these black pots are in uh, retail settings or exposed to sunlight. And it's astounding how hot black pots can get when they're exposed to summer sun. And so if it were me, if I was picking a tree, uh, I would aim for one that's in the center of the pile of trees so it has the most shade on that pot. When we went to retail centers, the trees that were on the very outer edge that were exposed to the south and the westerly sun, their pot temperatures on hot, on hot July days, June days, reached about 135 degrees. That's one inch in the soil, all right? So that's soil temperature. That is a real problem for us because root death occurs about it begins at about 85 degrees and it begins to ramp up at 90 95 degrees all right so we had black pots that were on the order of 135 degrees um, Fahrenheit what that has caused on those trees that were exposed to the south and the west Sun on the pot it caused those roots on that edge of the pot to literally be cooked and, and they were dead when we pulled them out and evaluated them and so you've lost a good portion of your root system now, when you plant it in the in the ground, you think your tree is nice and healthy, uh, but a quarter to to maybe forty percent of that root system had been cooked. All right, so you really have to be careful. So, when in doubt, if you see a tree in a white pot, that's already a better root system than one that's planted in a black pot, just because of the root zone temperature that you're going to face. All right. And so these girdling roots, um, you know, we see this with bald and burlap. Almost always they're too deep. And if you look at this, this is, this is a grafted tree. This is a, a, a graft union right here. Um, and that was about four inches. Um, so this dark soil line, there was about four inches of extra soil on that. Again, for me, about three inches is the maximum that I would ever want to see uh, additional to the top of that root system. And what I do is I look for the first main lateral root, all right? And that first main lateral root, if there's more than inch to two inches of soil, I'm going to scrape all of that soil off the top and set it off to the side. Because that tree root system breathes oxygen and respires CO2, I want that tree to be shallow, all right? three inches or deeper, that tree long-term is going to suffer, all right? You'll see some, some uh, very fine roots uh, on, these, on these areas that have been, been um, with soil right up next to the bark. Those are not good roots. Those are not long-term roots. I trim those off. I go to that first main lateral root, and that's where I set my depth, about a half inch to an inch below the grade of where I'm planting. All right. So the tree on the right, this is a tree that, this is an arborvitae that I bought. This is a really, this is a good tree. Um, now this is what you'd expect to see. These are, they're not real coarse woody roots. Uh, they have really nice light root tips, but they're, they've formed to the edge of the pot. And, and what I can do is I can take my, my uh, pruning shears, I can take a utility knife, and I can score down along where the cursor is. I can score uh, one, two, maybe three times all the way around this pot going top to bottom, and I'll X the bottom of those roots, and then I'll rough them up. And, and what you're doing is you're resetting the memory of those root systems. If I were just to dig a hole and put that arborvitae in the hole, those roots would have a hard time venturing out into the open soil because of the memory of going around and around in a pot. They're going to be pot bound for, for a long time. And so if I want this tree to respond as quick as possible and have as much nutrient and water resources in the ground as possible, I'm going to want to rough those roots up. It's the best thing you can do on a potted uh, or a B&B &B tree that, that has developed girdling roots on, on the inside. Rough those roots up, but don't destroy don't destroy them, you know. A lot of times people will want to do a box cut on those, and, and you can Google what that is or YouTube what that is on that seedling. And that really removes quite a bit of that fine root growth 
Um, you're asking that tree to replace that root growth. I think I can do it with a, a utility knife and be just fine. They'll go out. Um, it, but again, you're going to cut it with a utility knife and fluff it up um, with your hands. So things that we, we didn't catch um, on these trees, and, and here's a, a, a potted tree. It's a fairly good caliper. This is a ball and burlap, excuse me. Um, but what you, what you see is once we started opening the, the, the burlap up, because we need to take all of that off, we need to take all the wire off, we begin to see trees that don't have the right ratio of root ball to top. Part of what that root ball does, it yes, it gives it more roots, but what it also does is it, rest, it, it anchors that tree. You know, that tree, when it leaves out, is a big sail. And uh, you, you should not have to stake a tree that has the right root to shoot ratio or root ball to, to top ratio with, um, you know, three, four uh, tie downs. You shouldn't need to do that. Maybe one, maybe two. Um, but the anchor is the weight of that root ball. So as we remove dirt to get it at the right depth, we began to see uh, a, a, a big problem with this seedling. That's a standard pen, and here is the first main lateral root. You can see it was about six inches too deep. So what we thought we were buying was a 30-inch bald tree. In reality, when we scrape all of the dirt off down to the depth of where it needs to be to be planted um, correctly, again, six inches is way too deep. That's fatal to a tree. You would probably be taking off about half of the dirt that would anchor that tree in the ground. All right. And that's a real problem. If we left it as is, it would be dead in, in 20 to 30 years and it would not thrive. And we kept seeing this across the board. Some of this is a function of, of how the machines dig those trees. Some of it's a function of them just adding some soil to the top of it to make a bigger looking root ball, to add mass to it. Um, but we, we see this routinely um, in bald and burlap trees from, from areas where uh, the soil maybe is a little harder to dig and they have to reposition a few times. Um, invariably, that, that uh, spade will want to lift the dirt up around the edge. So just know that almost all B&B &B trees, you're going to have to do some level of excavation on that root system. But these are all extreme measures. Here we have another pen um, where on the right-hand side, we are seeing at least four to six inches in depth before we hit the root. Trees, when they're planted, are not supposed to look like telephone poles. So today, when you, when you get home and you, you walk around your community, look at the number of trees that come straight out of the ground. That's another dead giveaway that that tree is going to have long-term problems. All right, They should not look like telephone poles coming out of the ground. They should have a root collar sweep where the, where the stem meets the soil. There should be a well-defined flare on that root collar. Uh, if you don't see that, it's too deep. And then look up and, and follow that tree over time. And, and I guarantee you, you will start to see dieback uh, because that tree has been planted too deep. It's very common. Again, another one. Um, and, and on this one on the right-hand side, if you see that we've dug down 6, 8 inches to find the, the, the proper planting depth on a tree that size, when when we cut it off, and removed all of the dirt that shouldn't be there, you're left with a much smaller root ball. What we thought, if we followed the guidelines on this one, on a 30-inch um, root ball that weighed a couple hundred pounds, now is down to maybe 20, 24 inches. Um, that's a big issue because if we remember, um, if we washed all those roots, here's that coarse uh, root architecture that we're working with that that tree needs. And now what we've done is we've created um, this V, and, and the V would be formed down in here. So we've cut even more of those big tap roots off. So you really restrict the number and quantity and quality of roots when you have a tree that's buried. It just doesn't work right. All right, so this gives you a kind of an indication of on that, that tree in the background just how many roots 
um, of, of the big tap roots on those coarse roots, which would generate new fine feeder roots, have been lost through improper lifting. So here's a few more things that we didn't capture on, on delivery. And here's a tree. It's a big, tall uh, elm that, that's being planted. And, and immediately when you, you take off uh, the burlap and, and the wire and, and all of the soil begins to fall away, you know there's an issue. And what happened here is it was ordered at a certain size, and you can see to make that size, they just added sand as filler in the pot and in the basket. Um, that doesn't, I would I like to say that doesn't happen a lot. I hope it doesn't ha happen a lot. But you you need to be wary, and, you know, you're buying a several hundred dollar potted or bald and burlap tree. You have every right to open the top of that burlap up and take a look at it. If they don't want you to open that burlap or if they're not willing to help you open that up, that's another one of those red flags. You know, most nurseries that you go to here uh, in, in Iowa are proud of their trees. They're willing to show you this material. And if they find a problem with it or if you find a problem with it, um, they better not sell you that tree. They're, they better make it right. Gives you an idea. If you look back here, here is where that original tree was plant or was was dug here's all of the filler soil around it this is probably a, a 16 inch maybe 14 inch pot for that size of a tree put into a 30 inch basket um, that is just blatant that tree uh, has absolutely no chance at survival gives you a, a close-up shot of what they're looking at um, and, and that's you know, that's why we remove um, the burlap before we select which tree we're going to buy. So let's transition. Um, probably one of the, so the biggest issue I face is, is um, planting issues. And, and a lot of that starts um, even before you, you select that tree. It, it's a problem with the tree right from the get-go. The other issue we deal with on, on trees is, is pruning. And people ask me, well, what do I prune when I plant the tree? I hear I have to prune something. Well, unless it has a, a, a leader issue, so a dominant leader issue or a broken leader, I normally don't want to do any more stress or damage to that tree for a year or two. And so I have a few rules when it comes to pruning. And it's good that you know about those. Um, I only prune my trees in December, January, and February, all right? And I, I make an exception for those that I call my bleeder trees, all right? So, so your maples, your birches, your walnuts, they tend to run a tremendous amount of sap. And, and yes, it, on larger pruning cuts, that can, that can hurt the tree. Uh, it's unsightly. It's going to attract insects and, and uh, ants. It's going to drip sap on everything around it and have uh, mildew and that type of thing. And so you can, you can get around that by, by pruning either late summer or right after the leaves have fallen in the fall is probably the best time to prune those. The first part of, of the, the transition after you've cut uh, a, a, a branch off is for that tree to begin to dry the wound out. The, the wound has to dry for the tree to get the signal that it needs to callus over, all right? And, and so there's a few periods that I really don't ever want to touch a tree, uh, and one of those is during the spring grow-out period. Think of a tree as a, a, a piggy bank, and, and the root systems are already um, under stress, and they've been drawn down uh, just through the, the act of transplanting. And then it's put a tremendous amount of energy into growing new leaves. And so it can actually pull the piggy bank into the negative account balance, let's say. And so if you were to, to, to cut those uh, branches off after they've, they've leafed out but haven't really paid back into the piggy bank, you really are stressing that tree long term. Once that tree then, then uh, pays back into the piggy bank throughout the summer, it, it will grow faster, it will grow larger, um, the more canopy you have. And, and so we wait to prune our branches. Uh, and normally my rule of thumb is uh, you prune when that branch reaches one inch in caliper size. 
and you're done pruning by the time the branch is about two inches in caliper size. What that does is it gives you all of the, the growth on the stem and still allows you to, to sever that branch at the right time of year and allow it to seal over that wound within a few growing seasons before decay can set in. I do avoid during the fall color change period. We've learned a lot over the, the recent past about how trees um, during the leaf color change and just immediate to when the leaves change color and fall off, they pull back in a lot of the micronutrients that they need for next year. And, and it's called nutrient retranslocation. And so if you cut those leaves off uh, right at the beginning or those, those branches off, right at the beginning of the leaf color change period, what you're essentially telling that, that uh, tree is, well, you're going to have to go out into, into the soil and find those micronutrients on your own because we're, we're not allowing you to retranslocate them from the leaves. Some of the nutrients that gets retranslocated, it's on the order of 40 to 60%, maybe 70% of what that tree needs for the following growth. Uh, and so you're really hammering or, or hamstringing that tree if you if you cut it off before the leaves have fallen. Once the leaves have fallen, all the tree the the nutrient retranslocation has occurred, and that tree is set up the best it can be for the following year. So when people ask when do I prune? Well, all of my shrubs that don't have showy flowers. I'm going to plant or, or plan to prune late winter, early spring, and, and definitely do this before the buds expand. Because once the buds have started to expand and grow, that tree is sending sugar and nutrients um, north into their buds, and so you, you kind of miss that open window. So those trees or shrubs that have real showy flowers, normally what I do is I will prune mine right after their bloom. And so right now the lilacs have bloomed. They're just starting to, to drop their, their flowers. Um, and that's if, if you're going to plant or, or prune one of those showy flower type shrubs, now is the time to do it right after their, their blooms have, have uh, ceased. For fruit trees, we get a lot of calls about fruit trees. You really want to prune those late winter, early spring. Definitely for the buds begin to expand. Um, what you're doing is you're waiting for most of the, the winter to be over. And winter is hard on buds. You know, you will lose a certain amount of um, vegetative buds and fruit buds on fruit trees throughout the winter. And so you want to minimize the amount of, of damage you cause. And, and you want to maximize the amount of live buds that you leave on the tree. And so by pruning late winter, early spring, you're, you're right in that right happy medium. Of, of leaving the amount of live buds you need to. Oaks. Our oaks are very special in Iowa. Oaks are the state tree of Iowa. And, and for this pruning uh, section, to me, reds are more important than whites. All right. And I don't want you to look at those dates, March 1 to October 15th, as the, the be all and end all of, of dates of pruning. You need to look at, at the spring development, uh, and, and this year we were delayed uh, in our spring, and you probably could have pruned into, into March just fine. Other years, March is 70, and the bugs are out flying around, and oak wilt possibly could be transmitted. What I want to do is I want to prune early in the season. So I want to prune my oaks in November and December, and I want to leave those trees uh, early enough that they will have well a couple months to, to dry that wound out. All right. What I'm trying to do is limit the amount of exposure of an open wound that is running sap for those netadulid beetles, the picnic beetles that will transmit oak wilt. Now, the reason I talk about red oaks being more important than white oaks, all right, when it comes to pruning, but both are important, but reds are more so. Red oaks have a, a, a vascular structure that doesn't or can't slow down the spread of oak wilt. And so if you have an open wound on your oak tree, if you were to go out there right now in the summertime and prune it, and those netadula beetles can find that open wound in about 15 minutes. We've, we've cut down uh, trees that have storm damage. We've, we've cut open uh, chunks of firewood. And within 15 minutes, they're covered with netadula beetles. And, and the spore mats are getting ready to come out. 
and and those spores are carried on the backs of those bugs when they are attracted to the cut smell of that wound on that tree they will shed those spores and for red oaks the tree is functionally dead within three to six weeks there's nothing we can do about it white oaks they kind of, because of their physiology and the tyloses and their vascular structure, slows the movement of the disease down, and they can live with it. Uh, they can live with it for five, ten years until there's a secondary stress, like a drought. Uh, severe drought can kick in um, a more lethal mode of oak wilt in the white oaks, and then they'll up and die. And so oak wilt is really, it's it's not something to mess around with, uh, and, and so... If your tree does need to be pruned in the growing season, what I would recommend and do recommend is, is if you make that pruning cut within the first few minutes after that pruning cut is made, you paint it with a latex-based paint and, and just create a physical barrier so that netadula beetle uh, will not land on that open wound and transmit the disease. Um, I'm more conservative. Uh, you know, you talk to a pathologist, they'll say, well, by middle of summer, you'll be fine. Uh, I don't want to take that risk for your one or two main trees in your yard. Uh, so just be real careful of that. So how do we prune? We only target prune, all right? We never leave any stubs. And, and what I'm doing is I'm, I'm identifying on every branch, there is a branch bark ridge and there's a branch collar. The collar is the swell on the underside of that attaching branch. Those, the ridge in the collar, there's an area there that um, will form the callus tissue that will overtop that wound. And I always use a three-cut pruning method, all right? For any branch larger than about an inch, you need to use the one-cut uh, or, or the three-cut pruning method or you're going to have some tear out, all right? My first is an undercut, and I come in on the underside of this this branch that I'm going to cut off eventually and I cut up to about the middle point. I then come on the outside of it and I start on the top and I work my way through and as I begin to cut you'll eventually hear that branch break and what it's going to do is it's going to connect the dots between the second cut and the first cut and the branch will fall to the ground. Now this stub that you have to remove is it virtually weighs nothing it's not going to tear out the underside of this branch and so this is another thing you can, when you, when you walk around tonight, looking at those trees that are planted too deep, looking at the girdling roots, um, look for pruning cuts. Look for bad pruning cuts. Look for the stubs on those trees, all right? If you see a wound that, that is oblong, that's probably not the best pruning cut. So yes, there will be, when I make my final cut along this third dotted line, there's going to be a little stub left on this tree. But after about five or ten years, as that tree grows, it's going to seal itself off and you won't see that stub. It's much better than coming from the top of the branch bark ridge to the bottom of the branch collar and making an oval cut, all right? So let's look at this, uh, this method in photos. Here I am on a swamp white oak. I've done my undercut on this. Now what I've done is I've come on the top, and I've, I've come about a half inch or so up. And you can see I've made it almost all the way through this branch before it cracked and fell off. All right. Just make sure on these sharp saws, you can cut almost too fast and, and uh, defeat the purpose of the three-cut method. If if I had only done a one-cut method, I could have easily had this wood tear out down through here. And then finally, on this last cut, you have to identify the, the collar and the ridge. And if you look carefully right in here, every tree has a collar and a ridge. Some trees are easier to identify the collar and ridge than others. And so on this tree, I've identified that little swell, this little bump out right here. And I'm going to make my final cut where those dotted lines are, all right? If you do that, what you're going to be faced with is a pruning cut that has very little heartwood formation in it. If I followed my one inch to two inch kind of threshold for pruning, you'll minimize the amount of heartwood. 
So heartwood on a living tree will decay faster than sapwood. And so what I can expect is my callus tissues will form just under this bark. And in about two to three years of a really nice full-grown canopy tree, this wound should be sealed over. It should be walled off. There shouldn't be decay in this center portion. All right. Now, there's a lot more information out there. And... Um, what I've done is I, I've put together a few things. There's a couple of YouTube videos. There's one on planting trees, and you'll see that um, I've planted a potted cherry tree. And, and then there's a series on pruning, and, and uh, I believe it's a three-part series that I have, um, and, and it covers how to deal with um, double leaders, how to lift trees, and how to do a three-cut series. And they're about five to six minutes long each, uh, I would encourage you to go out and look at that material. There's a lot of good information out there. Um, if you have any questions, the easiest way to get a hold of me is my email, my contact information out there. Um, if you have questions on on what to look for or, or or how to plant it or if the tree has a problem, send me a photo. Send me lots of photos of them. Um, you know, we really like to see what you're looking at. But remember, your gut instinct, if you say you have a problem, you probably have a problem. You almost always have a problem. So send me photos. Give me a call. Send me an email. Um, I'd love to help you out with your trees. Have a great day, folks.